Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our next presenter, Peter Broad, if you're, if you're ready. Um, I'm ready, yes. Yeah, Peter will be discussing uh, big commercial shipbuilding, the challenges and highlights. Um, so yes, take it away. Thank you very much and good morning from South Korea. Welcome uh, to Broadreach Marine. I'm Peter Broad, uh, Managing Director, and I've been involved in shipbuilding um, for about 15, 16 years in Korea and China and Japan. So I'd like to share some of my experiences with you. Uh, for big commercial shipbuilding, um, what we do in Korea uh, at the moment is uh, going to be highlighted here with some explanation of uh, Japan and China as well. So these are the topics uh, which we're going to cover today, uh, this morning. Um, I'll go through them uh, in different slides. I will be trying to focus a little bit on the surveyor and what a surveyor does and who a surveyor is. So that's really hopefully going to bring out some good points for everybody. So I hope you can follow the presentation. So these are the areas we're going to talk about. And we start off, of course, with the owner. Um, why does he want to build a new ship? Um, the decision is purely commercial. Um, there is no point. Uh, he, he probably has not got a particular technical reason for building a ship. It will be commercial, which is the end of the day is to uh, move cargoes and make money. So uh, he quite often will not have technical experience for building and he will need to use uh, technical managers or a third party uh, to help him in that process, which is where I come in, my experience, which is good news. Um, so we see here uh, the relationship between the owner and the shipyard, and then we have the technical managers and the class society as we go through. Um, so what does he want? He wants the ship on time, on specification, and on budget. Um, the date when the contract is signed um, can be quite some time in advance of the actual vessel starting to be built. Uh, this is very important because the contractual date of the vessel uh, actually implies the uh, rules and regulations that will be applied to the contract at the time of uh, building. So if the contract is signed, one year before the building starts, then the applicable rules should be associated at that time and not the date of the vessel building. However, the date of keel laying is also very important for statutory requirements. So the owner has happily signed his contract with the shipyard. He then has to consider, perhaps he hasn't considered, but he has to consider how he's going to pay for his ship. Most ship owners don't use their own money, so they've got to borrow money from somewhere. They have to finance it. Um, there are various places that he can borrow money, uh, banks and institutions. And then, of course, uh, we have to consider the shipyard also needs some money up front as a stage payment to start buying and procuring the components to build the ship and the materials to build the ship. Some shipyards, um, are government funded, um, particularly in China now, uh, and also still in Japan. So they will get some backing from uh, government to help them with shipbuilding projects. Um, in Korea, it's normally uh, some sort of uh, guarantee bank. Um, the shipyard always needs to have a refund guarantee. So if the project fails in any way, they can always pay back the owner's money uh, as part of the the deal as an insurance. So the refund guarantee needs to be in place. Then we move to the shipyard, of course. Uh, the shipyard has a huge task uh, for ordering the equipment and everything which is fit for purpose and must be approved for the marine industry. It's no good bringing something which you go and buy in Argus or Curries in the UK um, and placing it on board the ship because it probably won't be fit for purpose for the marine environment. 
So everything has to be approved. Um, in order to do that, we will be looking at the who, who is doing the approval, which would be normally the class society. But the obligation is for the shipyard to order the correct equipment from their vendors. And the vendors should have experience for uh, equipment in the marine industry. Um, the owners, of course, will want to know about the serviceability of the equipment, major components. Uh, so they will have a, an input into the vendors list. And that will be part of the shipbuilding contract. Um, the owner will, of course, be interested in the maintenance of the vessel when she comes into service. So the vendors list and deciding who the components are going to be made by is very important. And they may have some service agreements for the major components with various vendors. So still using Korea as, a, as an example, if I may, um, who decides on the vendors, uh, who decides on the subcontractors and who decides on the class society. Um, showing South Korea as our example, um, all of those can be uh, sourced from overseas. Uh, we receive um, a lot of uh, high-tech equipment from Japan, as well as coming from Korea itself. We receive a lot of components uh, from China, and many components are made in the Americas, and of course, UK and Europe. So you can see the supply chain um, and the ordering of from components is, is a very complex um, process managed by the shipyard on behalf of the owners after the vendor selection has been agreed. Um, the photograph here is of a Chinese vessel, not typical, um, but I just wanted to use that as an example. And hopefully later on you'll see examples of how we're building in, uh, in Korea. Um, so the subcontractors, the, the, the shipyard is responsible for the quality assurance and health and safety of all of the building process, which means they should be responsible also for their subcontractors. The shipyard quality procedure should be applied to the subcontractors as well. That may mean that the subcontractor for a Korean shipyard might be in China. So we have to also try and work the Korean quality system into a Chinese shipyard. Obviously, we have to buy equipment, as we said before, it has to be approved and fit for purpose. Many of you know about the Marine Equipment Directive, which is the European logo we see at the top of the screen now. Um, we also have the quality standards for manufacturing and processes, the ISO 9000s and the ISO standards. We build still in Asia. We use uh, a lot of Japanese standards. Even though we're in Korea, the Japanese standard has been adopted as the norm. And Korean standard is almost a, a copy of the Japanese standard. The CE mark, everybody knows in UK and Europe, um, is a common standard for, most, for a lot of equipment. ASME is a very common used standard from Americas. Uh, any equipment that comes from the Americas is normally approved under ASME. And like I said, ISO is used as also as a, as a common standard, and very much so for um, a lot of electrical equipment and heavy machinery. Uh, then we have the Korean standard, um, which we're using here in Korea. And then we come into the HSE side of things. In the UK and uh, Europe, you'll know about the health and safety executive. Well, they would be responsible uh, to maintain and, and supervise the standards of the shipyards. In Korea, we have COSHA, Korean Occupational Safety and Health Authority, which is a government organization. Um, and then recently, there's been an initiative by all of the shipyards to try and standardize their uh, safety standards. Um, and that's coming under the KSSS, which is the Korean Shipyard Safety Standardization Program, which we are a partner in and helping to advise them on best practice. Um, so we should move on to the sh class society. Um, during the building phase, the class society is contracted by the shipyard. So many times the shipyard will have a preferred class society and that may mean that they work well together, they have various good understandings together, but it also comes down to cost. And it is a commercial decision, very much a commercial decision, which influences 
the use of which class is used for the building. Um, the owner may, of course, have his preference for a class society, uh, but at that case stage, the um, shipyard may have a different opinion and may impose additional cost if the owner wishes to use a particular class society, um, which is not the preferred one by the yard. But this is always something to be negotiated by the owner, and at the end of the day, uh, the owner can always transfer class on delivery. So there is always that option there. Not the best option, of course, but needless to say, it may mean that the owner can get his ship built maybe a million dollars cheaper if the uh, shipyard chooses a particular class society. So <clears throat> then we come on, we've been talking about the vendor selection. Um, we have to be make sure that they're approved. All the ship's hull structure, propulsion equipment, navigation equipment, safety equipment, major auxiliaries have to be approved and uh, come from approved works and tested. So they have to be certified, which means most of the time would be a class society would have to certify them. It could be an independent body, but we have to look at the whole supply chain. Where do the parts come from to build our ship? We even have to consider where the raw material comes from, which is the iron ore. In this case, this is uh, dredging and coming from, uh, the iron ore is coming from Australia. And then the steel uh, for our shipbuilding is made in Japan and uh, Korea. Um, particular special grades for shipbuilding. And smaller components, even valve bodies, and the castings of valve bodies could be uh, very critical to get the right material for that and of course the bronzes and nickel bronzes that we use for propellers so raw material and the supply chain and certifying and traceability right the way through the supply chain is very important the responsibility for that is with the shipyard but at the end of the day we actually check where all of the components come from before uh, they're installed on the ship it's a very very complicated organization um, by the shipyard procurement. <clears throat> so everything has to be inspected um, by the vendor. They have the line QC, by the shipyard, the quality assurance department, by the surveyor, the class surveyor, and by the owners. So hopefully by the time the equipment arrives at the shipyard, it is certified and fit for purpose and probably being pre-tested. Um, Every piece of the equipment coming into the shipyard and the blocks has to arrive in a timely manner so it's not going to delay the production. And the shipyard is just basically uh, an assembly yard. So they bring all the components together in one place and build the ship. Here you can see um, blocks are being delivered on a heavy lift ship, um, which these blocks were made for a container vessel in China and then brought to Korea for assembly. You can see that's the main uh, midsection of a full container vessel. So all we have to do is put those blocks into the dock and weld them up, put the bow on and put the engine room and the accommodation on and we have a ship. Um, big components like engines can weigh up to 500 tons. Uh, boilers can be a couple of hundred tons and accommodation blocks could be um, five to 800 tons. These are very, very big components which are coming from outside of the shipyard and need to be assembled in the yard. So who's going to do all of this work? Who or what is the surveyor? So we know traditionally the class society as our surveyors. Um, however, I believe that the technical managers play a big role in this. While their name is not surveyor, normally they're called inspectors, I think they do a very important role which is extremely similar to a surveyor. So really, we're just from the technical manager to the site team. These are probably employed to, employed uh, together. The technical managers will employ a site team. Maybe some of the owners would di directly. But anyway, they have responsibilities as surveyors. So we can see the class society will carry out mainly these functions: inspection at makers' works, type approval, certification, plan approval attendance at factory tests and site inspections and certification at delivery. So that could be delivery of a component or and finally delivery of the vessel. So all the certificates have to be issued by the class society. 
However, we have the technical managers and the site team. There's a lovely site team, me standing in the middle with the dark glasses on. Uh, that was our last project. And we actually have the responsibility, very similar to class, um, and in many cases, we are checking um, what class is doing at the end with the delivery of certificates and making sure everything is on board, ready for delivery of the vessel on behalf of the owners. Also, our function is very important to train the crew um, in the new vessels that they're going to be taking over. So part of our responsibility is the handover of the vessel to the operations department and getting her ready to sail. Um, plan approval is also a process which is carried out both by class and the owners. Uh, we obviously have some very specialist uh, technical people. For example, here we can see a FMEA, failure mode effect analysis, where they're using a mesh facility here and computer modeling uh, for the high stress areas. This is done in part by the shipyard, but it has to be checked again by a third party, normally the class. Uh, the owner's team, technical managers, will have a plan approval team, uh, which uh, has to go through many, many drawings and return them to the shipyard. Um, many times the production cannot start until the plan approval drawings have been returned to the yard. So just as an example, uh, you can see here how many drawings might need to be approved for a particular ship type, bulkers, up to 220, tankers 250, LNGs I'm working on at the moment. Uh, we currently have 411 drawings to approve in about five months period, which is quite busy. Passenger ships could be even further, even more, many, many drawings for passenger ships. We normally get about six months uh, before the steel cutting to do the plan approval. So in Korea, uh, most shipyards, uh, build all the hull blocks and major components uh, themselves. Um, <clears throat> but they are, I say, bringing them in from subcontractors. So we have a specialist subcontractor who's making accommodation blocks and engine casings, and they will be brought to the yard. Um, so we have to look at the quality control. Here's a, here's a bow section, which is very complicated because it has a double curvature. Uh, this is built by another specialist subcontractor and then brought to the yard for assembly. Um, so like I said, many, some of the subcontractors may not even be in the same country. Uh, in our case, we have blocks that come from China, and we have to supervise the construction in China as well as uh, building the vessel in Korea. Um, the varying sizes of blocks, uh, it really depends on the cranage capacity of the shipyard um, and the ability of the subcontractors to lift them. We can range from 100 tonnes to 1,200, 1,500 tonnes, depending on the grainage. Um, many of the blocks will be pre-outfitted and pre-painted before they arrive at the yard. So we only have to do these main seams when we weld them up in the shipyard. So here we are building the ship. All the blocks have been fabricated at the subcontractors. They're transported to the shipyard for the dock erection stage. Here's that picture again. So these blocks will get offloaded and put into the building dock and then the welding will be done by the shipyard workers. And then we have these blocks placed together and welded together. Again, we have some uh, lower part of the accommodation. This is about a 500 ton block getting loaded on top here onto the hull structure. Um, we have a floating crane here which can lift a 1500 ton blocks. As you can see, we would be offloading these midsection blocks off a heavy lift ship and lifting them straight into the building dock like that. So I'd like to go to um, a slide, if we can make this run. Here we go. Here's one we prepared earlier. I hope everybody can see this. This was an LNG ship which we built for Shell Nigeria, Bonnie Project in 
This is building over a period of about 12 weeks. All the blocks come from the subcontractors, some of them by sea, and the assembly in the dock and float out is done in 12 weeks. Then we flood the dock up and float her out. And we built two the same. There we are. So <clears throat> that was building an LNG, um, 12 weeks uh, work compressed into about three minutes. Anyway, there we are. So then we move to uh, the outfitting stage. Once the vessel is launched, we have several weeks alongside where there's uh, more outfitting to be done and commissioning before we can go to the sea trials. So you can saw there, after 12 weeks, we move to launching the vessel. Um, this is now a picture of uh, Daewoo DSME shipyard. You can see the size of a LNG ship next to a Maersk uh, container ship. This is a, the, the, the LNG is a 173,000 cubic meter LNG. So you can see the m massive size of the Maersk vessel there. And then it's time to go to uh, sea trials to test, fully test the vessel before delivery. Um, this is a photo of the LNG ship, which uh, was the built in HHI. Um, for Shell Nigeria. Um, the sea trials are essential to confirm the propulsion and all its auxiliary machinery and the safety and uh, navigation equipment. It's also very important for familiar, familiarization and uh, crew training. Many times this will be possibly the first time that the superintendent who is going to be responsible for the operation of the vessel may come to the building and actually see the vessel in operation. So we have a, a lot of time are necessary to hand over and familiarize the crew and the operations team of the vessels. Um, with an LNG and an LPG, often we will do a second trial, which will be called the gas trial. So we need to then test the cargo machinery actually with the liquefied gas. So once we've tested the propulsion machinery during the sea trial, we come back and then a few weeks later we go away and we'll do another gas trial. So we have several weeks of trials at sea. Now I'd like to show you the video of, uh, if we can get this one to run. Let's see if this is gonna go. There we go. This is on YouTube. This is a vessel which we delivered earlier this year. Um, she's called Patrice. She was delivered for owners Uh, Chandris, taken as a professional, com professional video, 
for the owner's promotion. This is the vessel as she's just finishing in the dock prior to launching. She's on the, the left side of the picture. Sorry, Peter, to interrupt. We can't actually see that video. Okay. Um, Can you... I'll stop it here. I did send you the link to it. Can you find that link? Uh, yeah, there are bits of sharing. Yeah. It's on the, showing on the slide now. Can you see that? www.youtube.com watch. Can you see that? Yeah, we're just uh, grabbing it up now for you. Okay, thank you. It's about a five or six minute YouTube video. Good technology. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. That's the one. Thank you very much. So this vessel is the uh, Patrice, um, which is Greek for uh, our country. Um, it's a name which has been used by the Chancellor's family for uh, five vessels. She's the latest to carry this name. So this is an aerial view of the SME number one building dock. And we finished the dock construction and then we boat her up. As you can see, more than one vessel in the building dock at the time. We had four vessels at the time. Uh, there were two LNGs and two BLTs getting built at the time. Part, part of the BLTs is the there on the other side of the screen. Trying not to scrape her on the side, not damage the paintwork. So she's not in the fully painted condition. Uh, you can see a lot of the primer coat is the brown color. The finished color will be the, the um, gray, gray top sides. Uh, this is normal. We can finish the, finish the painting when we're on the lay by berth for out further commissioning time. And then we head out to sea. Again, an opportunity for us to help with the crew training and part of the handover process. Testing everything, all the machinery, all of the navigation equipment, doing speed trials, maneuvering. Trials takes 
spoke since they a week, sometimes 10 days, depending on if it's the first of a class. And then, as I said before, we have to do a gas trial for these particular LNG ships where we would load uh, LNG as a cargo, partial cargo. Then we go out again and test all the cargo machinery. The gas trials are normally taking um, two, three weeks to do because we spend a lot of time having to cool the tanks down. Peter, that um, large structure on the right, the starboard side of the main deck just in front of the bridge, is that the reliquification re plant? Uh, there is a relic inside there. It's, it's, the, it's a partial reliquification. It's, um, that's, we normally call it just a compressor room, but you've probably seen a full re has been uh, quite a large piece of equipment up on the bow ships in the past. Right. Um, this equipment now is getting a lot smaller and, and is contained within the compressor room, yes. Great, thanks. So these ships are quite high performance. Um, their normal uh, operating speed is up around 18 and a half to 19 knots. They'll do about 22 knots uh, in a fully laden condition. As you can see, it was very calm and sunny here in Korea. Especially when we're doing the trials, always perfect conditions. The NO96 type of uh, containment system, which is used by DSME. Uh, Samsung and HHI use the uh, Mark III. The ships look almost the same, um, slightly different arrangement in their cargo tanks. coming to an end now. So this vessel was delivered in January this year, 2018, and she's now in service. She's already loaded two cargoes. See there, 294 meters long. Um, she has a capacity carrying about, um, where are we now? So there we go. That's uh, she was built for Chandris as the owners and K Line and the technical managers. Okay, I think we go back to my slides. Can we see the slides? I've got Mike Wall up here. Are you able to share your slides again, Peter? I have to go to share again, do I? Okay, Maybe. sorry. Yep. Oh, here we go. On that one. There we go. Share. Fantastic. Thank you. Is that okay? Good. Thank you. That worked better than I thought it was going to. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And then obviously we've done our sea trials and our gas trials, and then we're ready for um, delivery. Um, this is very important time for us uh, to hand over the vessel, um, make sure the crew have got everything they need, understanding. Obviously, um, all of the certification we were talking about before, class society, all of the vendors, um, drawings, everything that they should be putting on board for the crew. Um, the crew have to spend a certain amount of time storing the ship, loading it ready with fuel, uh, water, vittles, and their training and familiarization. Uh, this is the time, of course, where we start to have our audits. Um, and the charterers will be taking a lot more interest in the vessel. It's a very busy time for the senior officers, the captain, to arrange all of these things, and the superintendent, and the operations department. Uh, many times the crew are not allowed to live on board or take over the ship until one day before delivery. Um, that's purely from an insurance point of view. The shipyard don't like the crew operating the ship. 
um, or touching anything until it's actually been handed over because the responsibility remains with the shipyard. So if there's any problems or damages, it's still their responsibility. And then we have the nice event of the naming ceremony um, where we can show the vessel off to the owners uh, and the captain actually takes over the vessel. So that was very nice. That one was at the 1st of uh, October this year. Um, like I said, crew familiarization. Uh, this was the vessel sailing away on the 4th of October into service. Some owners allow two or three days uh, familiarization of the crew and training. Some allow a couple of weeks and some don't allow any time at all. Certainly the first in a series of ships, we would expect the crew to at least have a week uh, familiarization to get used to the vessel. Sometimes this will only happen on the delivery voyage. So the crew actually sail the ship and they have to be learning about her um, while they're on the way to the first loading port, which isn't necessarily the best process, but that's the commercial constraints that are put on the crews these days. Um, and that's where we hand over to the operations and charterers. So these are a couple of my vessels I've built in the last few years. The one on the top is the Kinesis, was delivered uh, this year in October, and the green one at the bottom is uh, Shell Nigeria. She was built and delivered a couple of years ago from HHI. So really that's coming to the end of my presentation. I think I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, but I don't want to drag this one out. Um, I say thank you very much. Uh, we've been working in shipbuilding for, for 26 years. Um, if you need any further information from us, we're here based in Korea, um, consultancy company uh, for new building and existing ship surveys and insurance work. Uh, there is a book on the market about marine surveying available through Witherby's with the ISBN there if anybody's interested and that's it thank you very much if there are any questions I think that's the end of my presentation thank you thank you Peter that's fantastic are there hey, any questions Peter. hey Peter this is Dan Robsham from the United States uh, we, do Hi, Dan. A, we do a lot of work in uh, shipbuilding in Europe although this is typically specialty ship uh, one thing at the delivery that we tend to provide is a list of uh, incomplete contract deliverables. I didn't see that on your list, but in as much as we try to get everything delivered all at once, we do try to get that as part of the acceptance and delivery protocol. Um, yeah, I have to say, I mean, we normally... At the end of the sea trials, we normally have a punch list of owners' comments, which could be several hundred items, which are um, most most of the time in Korea we don't have any incomplete items uh, at time of delivery. Um, there are very few occasions where we might have some uh, issue with a piece of machinery which has to be repaired or something like that which happens very much at the last minute um, where the owners would then ask for an additional warranty or they would like the yard to attend the vessel in service to, to complete this work. Um, to be honest in Korea, we very rarely have incomplete vessels. It, my responsibility as the project manager is to deliver the vessel in a complete condition. So I think the yards here are pretty good at that. Certainly I've heard of, uh, a project in China recently, uh, only last week actually, uh, an L uh, a VLCC, uh, the owners were going to China, Shanghai, one of the yards there uh, on the Friday, for the vessel to be delivered on the Monday. The site team had over 450 comments outstanding on the Friday evening and the vessel was not painted. Oh. <laughs> And it was raining. Yeah, I, I would I would say it, uh, my experience is the the most niggling things are the trailing documentation, uh, as built plans, these type of things. I I I really like to get those documented as a as an incomplete deliverable if they are indeed 
not delivered into our hands in the agreed contractual yeah. method. So that's one thing. Uh, so I've had some we, owners that insist on the delivery of the vessel, uh, particularly in the passenger ship sector, because you have to you have to make uh, a cruise date, and it's just yeah. not negotiable. <laughs> we normally, for an example, um, the vessel you just saw up there, the Kinesis, she delivered on the 1st of October, which was a Monday. Um, the shipyard provided us with all of the as-built drawings and all of the certificates on Friday the 29th of September. So we actually had them uh, three days before delivery. We checked through all the deliverable certification. Um, we inventory of drawings. We had something like 36 boxes of as-built drawings and vendors uh, information. Uh, there was a full set, there were full two sets placed on board the vessel um, and a set of drawings also uh, in our site office was available um, for the owner's technical managers, which was then sent to London for the technical managers. So normally we're pretty good at getting all of that equipment on board. Certainly if you were to have an audit by an oil major um, and that sort of a the drawings weren't there and the certificates that weren't there, then that would have a significant effect on the charter. Uh, the vessel would not be deemed ready for operation if they were not delivered on board. Okay. Uh, are you seeing in Korea uh, the documentation packages being delivered uh, on board the vessel and to the owners or the technical managers in uh, electronic format indexed with software packages to, to uh, open them and, and index them, so to speak? Uh, yeah, we get a hard copy. We get two sets of hard copy uh, drawings and certificates and vendors drawings, which are placed on board. And we get soft copy of all the vendors drawings, uh, which are um, in PDF format. And we also get all of the shipyard drawings um, in a secure PDF format, which cannot be copied, but they can be read, read only because of the intellectual property. Uh, rights, but no, we do get everything. Everything we wouldn't deliver the ship without them. Put it that way. I wouldn't be allowed to deliver the ship without them being on board. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. If you'd like to build some ships in Korea, please come and talk to me. <laughs> yeah, all right. I tell you what, I saw some photographs that I'd love to show some some of the production managers that I work with. I I really like the one photograph showing the pre-assembly of the staging uh before the next uh block got landed on top i thought that was that was pretty slick it's a specialist uh thing that we do for lngs but um it's very efficient and there are a couple of specialist subcontractors they're not yard they're not the yard um scaffolding team uh they use specialist guys they're very very efficient and very good and very safe which is which is wonderful to work with them actually yeah yeah no it, it's it, it's super just these little time savers all the way along help everybody in the process thank you so yeah. much great great show thank you very much thanks for your <clears throat> feedback peter mike wall um i was involved in a shipbuilding project in fiji back in 1992 where they were still using traditional rods and because of the <clears throat> humidity temperature humidity etc they, they weren't using hot boxes or anything so that uh, they were having to re-weld seam three times and eventually having to cut material out because it was too brittle. I take it that now the Korean shipyards are using, completely using TIG and MIG now and not rods anymore. Um, most of it is semi-automatic. Um, with, the, with the block construction, a lot of it is done in the shops, uh, in, the, in the building and fabricating areas. So it's done under very good controlled environments. Um, we still do have very high humidity uh, here in the summer, as you know, and high temperatures here in the summer. Um, but the equipment, I mean, it, it, if you're using a semi-automatic welding process, it tends to be um, hopper fed and automatic and, and it, it's very, it's extremely well controlled. We do, we do have our problems. I mean, uh, we have typhoons here and we have uh, a lot of, of humidic problems but not many big problems with welding defects now, not at all. A lot, there isn't a much, only the, what we call the dock erection seam. So you saw those blocks uh, that were on the back of the heavy lift ship, the, the midsection blocks for a container vessel. So they, we've got a ring joint, um, which has to go all the way around 
uh, transversely. Uh, that, that would be on the vertical sides and the uh, flat bottom, all of that would be uh, semi-automatic welding. So the only bit which would be manually done would be the turn of the bilge because we can't get the uh, welding machine to stick on there very well with the magnetic wheels. And it, tends to, it tends to fall off. Um, yeah. So no, the, the quality of the welding is, is fantastic. And I would say the quality of the manual welding is also very well controlled. Um, and the rods, like you were saying, keeping them in, in uh, hot boxes and things like that. We actually have uh, controlled hot boxes on board and in the dock and you know close to the welding process so it's it's pretty well controlled here yeah um in china because i, I was a surveyor in hong kong for nearly 20 years and spent a lot of time in china and korea and japan um the the problem you've got of course is the quality of workmanship and in china you need to have at least 10 superintendents on board to be monitoring what's going on how does that compare with what's going on in korea um, our average site team for uh, one vessel, if all the blocks are built in Korea, the average site team is about 12 people. That's good. Um, I would probably have a couple of hull inspectors and a couple of paint guys because obviously they're the front end of the work and then we would bring in uh, machinery, electrical um, and so on. With the LNGs we have to have a couple of guys for containment as well. But for, for one vessel, we could probably, probably about 12 people would be su sufficient. If we've got blocks overseas, which we've got at the moment, we've got China, we're getting blocks built in China. I have two hull inspectors and two paint inspectors actually staying in the yard in China full time. Yippee. <laughs> <laughs> They're okay, it's doing a good job. Okay. Thank you, thanks very much. <laughs> We'll stop it there and uh, get ready for the next presentation. I, thank you so, so much, Peter. Um, thank you. We'll be back in uh, 15 minutes with Ken Livingston. Thank you very much. Thanks for your feedback as well.